Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Early Learning Council for March 28th, 2019. And welcome, everybody. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. Um, Alyssa, will you call the roll, please? Yes. Uh, Sue Miller. Here. Uh, Patrick Allen, are you on the phone? Okay. Martha Brooks. Yeah. Great. Denalda Dodson. Present. Holt Gill is excused. Holly Marr is excused. Fairbors Paxaresh is excused. Um, Eva Ripito, are you on the phone? Okay. Shauna Rodriguez? Here. Um, Donna Schnitker is excused. Terry Tallhopper? Here. Uh, Kali Thorne Ladd is excused. Uh, Bobby Weber, are you on the phone? Yes, I am. Present. You. Miriam Calderon? Present. And then do we have Kate Wilcox? Present. Great. Liesl Went Present. And Candace Pelt. Present. Great. All right. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, and I'd also like to welcome Chelsea Bunch, who is here um, and representing housing for us. So we're delighted to have you here, Chelsea. And Happy to be here. Yeah. <laughs> you, as we put our strategic plan together, we recognize more and more how important <laughs> you are and the information you bring. So thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. Happy to be here. And I also wanted to uh, welcome Liesl, who is the Deputy Director of DHS. Um, as you know, Kim Friedland has been our advisor from DHS, and Fairbors has now asked Liesl to take that position. So welcome. Thank you. Happy to And here. thanks for being a part of this, Liesl. Thank Great you. to have you here. Um, I have no report to give, so we will uh, move on to the consent agenda. And as you know, those are basically our two committees that have met. Any questions from um, those reports or questions of the chairs of those committees and council members? Chair Miller. Yeah. Um, the only thing that I would ask is the um, presentation that was be given by the OHA epidemiologist on maternal uh, mortality and morbidity. I'd, I'd love to see that presentation, whether it's given to us or we could just have slides or the data. Or, I think it'd be mm -hmm. interesting to see. We can do whatever you all want. She would be happy to come and do a presentation. It's it's pretty powerful presentation um, and or slides. Okay. Well, Alyssa, why don't we get the slides uh, mm -hmm. from Kate, and then let's see if we want to put it on an April or May agenda, Great. depending on what our agendas look like. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Carrie. Okay. If there are no questions on those, then will someone just move the um, consent agenda? I would move that we accept the consent agenda. Second. Okay. All right. Any discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. They are in the record. Miriam, director's report. Thank you. Um, so you have a copy of uh, the uh, written director's report. Um, so I'll, I'll keep this brief. Um, uh, first, we'll start with some um, HR updates. Um, the uh, two main things I want to highlight is number one, we have um, uh, selected a new deputy director for the Early Learning Division, um, and she has accepted. Um, her name is Betsy Einholt, and, and she's currently working um, as the chief of staff for the uh, Senate um, president, Peter Courtney. Um, she'll be joining us um, in mid-July uh, in this new role um, once um, she sort of uh, wraps up her current responsibilities um, with the legislative session. Um, you have Betsy's um, background there, but as you can see, she brings um, a lot of experience um, within the Oregon state system, both with her time in the Capitol as well as working in agencies. Um, so we are uh, thrilled uh, to bring bringing Betsy um, on board, where she's going to really help with um, uh, overseeing our sort of programmatic work and grants administration and really I think supporting the ELD and moving kind of um, cross-cutting um, work um, within the ELD. So uh, we look forward to um, welcoming Betsy and I will work with her to see if there are some 
um, opportunities in the future as we transition her into the role. I know we've talked about having her do some meet and greets with staff at the Early Learning Division, and I think we can include um, council members as a part of that if some of you haven't um, had the chance to um, meet or get to know mm -hmm. Betsy through some of the other hats that you wear. Um, I think you have, Sue. Yes. 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 This is Betsy's going to be a wonderful addition to the Early Learning Division. There are a lot of nods around the yeah. table of people who have worked with yeah. her before. So uh, we're very fortunate that she wants to be here and has a passion for the work that we're yeah. doing. Yeah, so very much Congratulations. So. Thank you. Um, I also want to, um, you'll see that we've made um, a couple of other hires at the ELD. Want to call out that we are still um, recruiting for, um, our, our finalizing recruitments for two very important positions in the Office of Child Care. Um, one is our Field um, Operations Director. Um, we will be um, uh, finalizing that um, hopefully in the next week or so and we've also started interviews for um, our legal and enforcement director so we'll continue to keep you updated um, um, on those very important recruitment processes um, and then I want to announce um, the retirement of Kelly Walker from the early learning division um, she has been really playing an integral role in management of our child care development um, block grant fund um, putting working to put our child care state plan together um, uh, with um, stakeholders and partners and then I think working really closely with the team at DHS and the self-sufficiency unit around um, meeting the different federal requirements associated with CCDF. Um, we are um, as given Kelly's sort of tenure here, she was with the licensing program prior when it was at the employment um, division or department and was part of the transition over. She wore a lot of multiple hats, so we're going to be looking at, I think, this position again internally and thinking about how we um, structure it, but are really excited for Kelly. She's um, going to be, she's retiring from state service and um, continuing um, now to work um, and technical assistance around subsidy policy sort of at the national level. So she's got an exciting new chapter um, in her career ahead. Um, so uh, next I'll touch on um, session updates. We have more time on the agenda um, to discuss, discuss what's happening in session, but I'll just say really um, briefly, um, uh, we have a, on the three early learning division bills that were introduced, um, by Governor Brown, um, we have uh, a couple of updates, both um, House Bill 2024, which is the legislation that would um, codify and create baby promise, as well as 2025, our preschool alignment bill um, moved out of committee. Um, and we've got the licensing bill, which has a number of additional enforcement tools for the Office of Child Care HB 2027 scheduled um, for a work session this coming Monday. So we're on track um, with all three of these bills to meet the deadline of April 9th is to have um, uh, work sessions um, completed um, in the first chamber. I um, also want to share the... Um, uh, early Learning um, Council bill um, passed the House floor, um, is now moving on to the Senate uh, for a vote. Um, there were some um, additions made to that bill, um, clarifying um, the role of the Youth Development Council relative to the Youth Development Division that were added, but from the perspective of, as we've talked about the bill substantively, right, Alyssa, there's been no significant changes for the, the council. Um, which I believe we discussed last month is uh, we clarified that one of the at-large positions um, that's voting would need to be uh, for tribal representation. Yep, great. So um, good uh, progress on that front as well. I um, also want to share that um, the team at ELD um, is um, working on the hub monitoring process. So um, those site visits started in late January and are going um, through the beginning of May. As you can see, we've um, completed about half of the um, monitoring visits to date. Um, and we'll be um, looking forward to sharing a, uh, a briefing and an update um, on the hub monitoring process with the council later this summer. So just an FYI for now that that's underway. Um, I want to share um, a, also uh, a brief update on the preschool development grant. Um, just a, And then I will ask um, Kate and uh, Shauna to share anything about project launch, which is some information that we also included. But on preschool development grants, um, we are um, 
uh, in process of contracting with Portland State University to do um, the sort of first major um, deliverable and task of the preschool development grant, which is the statewide needs assessment. Um, so um, we are, I think, finalizing scope and the agreement with PSU, and we are hoping that by either our April or our May meeting, we will be able to come back and share more information with the council about um, the, the process and the work that PSU will be doing to complete the statewide needs assessment. Um, we're also um, working on finalizing um, and getting um, set up other important contracts that we know um, we need to execute to be able to implement the work of PDG. So that, and know Kate, do you want to share anything about Project Launch? Um, so Project Launch is a, um, an awesome opportunity for Oregon. It stands for, oh, help me, Shauna, linking. I used to have this down pat because we were a grantee a long time ago. <laughs> linking something, something outcomes for children's health. And it's, um, it's zero to eight. Unmet needs, I think. Of it. Yeah, yeah. It's unmet needs, right. And it's, um, it's to cover zero to 12, or zero to eight years old. Um, and the focus, the reason why this is such of such interest is this grant could be either led by the Early Learning Division or by the Oregon Health Authority. About half of the required domains and work that's needed to be done lies in each um, each agency. And so we were batting it around back and forth a little bit about who would get it. And so it landed in OHA, but we're not going anywhere without our ELD partners, arm <laughs> in arm. Um, and so it's $800,000 a year for five years. Um, it includes one FTE that will be the program coordinator. And then you work closely with a community so that you get the state and local um, connection. So at the state level, it's about systems and, and coordination across sectors. And then the same thing happens at the local level. And there's, um, there are pieces around behavioral health. There are pieces about child wellness. There are pieces around uh, marketing um, on behalf of child wellness. So, um, so it's pretty exciting. Um, like I said, we had it before. Um, we were part of the first cohort way back when, before hubs even existed. And um, the local partner was Deschutes County. Um, and then the next year, Multnomah County had their own standalone. I think so you were involved. I was involved in that, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it's come back around again, and we're going to give it our best shot to, mm -hmm. to try to get this, because it's a, it's a great opportunity. And Kate, we, we've also been hearing that there's some other communities that may be applying to, so multiple be, yeah. awards could be made in yes, Oregon. absolutely. And it's not limited to like a state level with a local partner. It could also just be a local um, applicant. Mm -hmm. I think there's only eight awarded nationally. <clears throat> Ten. Ten, okay. Yeah. Wow. So it's, it's, it's very competitive. It's very competitive. Um, That's really exciting. Yeah. So... There's so much talk, and certainly over in the legislature, about behavioral health, mental health, you know, going all the way down to early learning, but certainly in the school systems. Mm -hmm. So how does that whole conversation, and I think kind of increased awareness of the importance of behavioral health, how, does, how do those conversations fit into this opportunity? They do. I mean, we're going to be linking in the behavioral health unit within OHA, where a lot of that work is happening. Um, I, you know, we just got the approval. We're still fleshing out all the concepts and working and identifying the local community, um, but we have to move pretty quickly because the applications do April fourteenth. So. Yeah. But but that's very much on the radar. Um, and there, there's some learnings and work um, coming out of the McVie um, program, both within our state, but also um, in our regional um, innovation grant that we have that we think we can apply um, to more of that early, like the infant toddler. But we also need to be very cognizant that this grant goes up to eight years old. So crossing that into that kindergarten up to age mm -hmm. uh, grade three. Right, right. So I don't have the specifics yet, but it's absolutely on our radar. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Terry. Um, how would the Young <coughs> Child Wellness Council interact with the Early Learning Council and the what's the other the the Youth Development Council? They could be one and the same. Oh, okay. We have to have an entity. And okay. This could be the entity. Oh, okay. Or it's not creating which is necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay. When we had it before, we didn't really have an entity, so we had to create it. Um, and, but now we have so many opportunities that um, 
and it just it fits really nicely with the work that's happening here. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see in the in the um, writing some of the uh, grant. Um, the focus uh, yep. in the grant and some of the overlap, I think, with Raise Up Oregon and a number of things that yeah. we've talked about in moving in that plan. And I think, actually, this first one is, thank you, I didn't even see that you put all the domain or all the required yeah, pieces yeah. here. Um, the screening and assessment one is really exciting because we know in Oregon we do a really good job with screening. And as we're going to see, you know, we've heard before that it's what happens after with the referrals and those closed referral links that where we need to focus our attention. So I think this will give us some opportunity to do that. And 20% of states will get one of these. Yeah, approximately. Okay. Well, you know, states, anybody can apply. So we don't know what the, what the denominator will be. <coughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But we do know they'll give, I think it's 10 awards. Yeah, you did have not very many. Yeah, not very many. <laughs> no, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a lot of yeah. money. Thank you, Kate uh -huh. and OHA for taking the lead, and we look forward to supporting you. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Sure. Well timed. This <laughs> short. Okay. You do what your staff suggests. Yes. Right. Always. Always. <laughs> so um, any questions? No, I was just saying, Kate, if you need some um, support in the mental health consultation. I yes. know the Head Start group would be able to give you a lot of information about the need for that yes. pop in that population, the zero to five population. So be great. Because it I think this is an emerging need that's exemplified <coughs> over the last few years. Yeah. So, Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks Miriam. Sure. Exciting report. Exciting staffing changes here. Yeah. All right, we are on time, I hope. So if, <laughs> if I remember correctly, Colleen is calling in. Is that correct? Yes. Colleen, do we have you on the phone yet? Yes, I'm on. Great. Oh, hi. From what? Texas? Arizona? San Diego. San Di oh. <laughs> One of those places where yeah. it's sunny yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't feel too sorry for her. <laughs> no, I won't feel sorry for her at all, actually. Uh, I could if it were other places. Um, and is is Dana coming? Or? Right here. She's here. Dana, Dana. Dana welcome Hi. back. <laughs> Thank you. How fun to see you. Oh my goodness. Um, what is the best position okay. for us? What is the best position? Right up here? I okay. Have Front and center. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice, a friend and a common person. Yeah, yeah. this is great. We are very excited about this presentation. We know that you all have been working on this for a while, long while, and we really appreciate you coming to give us an update on where you are. So thanks Great. for being here. Well, thank you for having us. Um, I think we'll do a round of introductions for, uh, for the presenters. Um, I'm Dana Harganani. I'm the um, Chief Medical Officer for the Oregon Health Authority. and um, I know many of you, uh, having had the opportunity to work uh, on this council before, and really pleased to be here to share this important work we're doing in partnership with many others. So, John? And I'm John Collins. I'm the Interim Deputy Director for Behavioral Health at OHA. Um, my other job, or where a lot of this work actually occurred, was in the Health Analytics Group, and I'm also the Director of Health Analytics. Brenda Kamenia, I'm the director for the Early Learning Hub for Crick Deschutes Jefferson Counties and the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. And um, my role today is at the um, kind of end of the presentation, how we are using the data um, locally um, as that work is emerging for us. Great. Colleen, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Colleen Ruland, and I'm the director of the Oregon Pediatric and Food Partnership. And uh, we've been able to be fortunate enough to be a partner with the Oregon Health Authority on developing and operationalizing this model of health complexity. And then working with various coordinated organizations and early learning hubs on how we take this data and move it to action in terms of better serving young children. 
Great. Well, thank you for bearing with us as we do a multi-city presentation today. Um, I'll just walk through the agenda and some opening information, and then um, Colleen and John are going to take the leads on presenting uh, some of the data and how we're doing this work, and then we'll pass it on to hear from the community work to put this in action. So again, uh, first context setting is what I'm going to start with. Um, we're going to then lead directly into talking about how we're using state level data to operationalize kind of three aspects when we think about children's health, their medical complexity, their social complexity, and then when we combine it, their overall health complexity. Um, we're going to talk to you about how we're sharing this data uh, to ensure that it's action oriented for CCOs and communities, and then again, hear how this works at a community level. So why focus on children's health complexity? Um, I think all of these statements are going to be uh, real to you and all the work you do as a council. We know that uh, lifelong health really starts in the earliest uh, stages, both prenatally and in the earliest childhood. And we also know that children's health are ultimately completely impacted by their social environment, uh, by the um, history that they faced, um, and uh, particularly uh, the disparities they're facing within their health and access to services. Um, we certainly know this through the research from the adverse childhood ex uh, experiences that really exemplifies uh, this impact on children's health. Um, we know that in order to really make a movement forward on our ultimate goals for health and early learning, um, that we really need to think through specific strategies that can drive our focus on this area in a meaningful way that improve outcomes. And in particular, we need to think about how kids sit within both their family structure and their community structure and how we best support the resiliency that they have and drive uh, the needs that they have so that we can improve those outcomes that we all share together. Um, certainly the work that we're going to share with you today fit um, perfectly within the goals we have for CCO 2.0. So as I suspect you've discussed before uh, amongst this council, we are in the middle of a procurement for our next set of coordinated care organizations. And at the outset of the work to development, develop those policies, Governor Brown um, asked the Health Policy Board and OHA to focus on these priority areas as you see here. So really focusing on improving the behavioral health system in particular for children focusing on how we improve pain for value over just um, the number of services we provide, um, ensuring that we're focusing on social determinants of, of health and equity specifically, as we know they're key drivers to ultimate health outcomes, and then sustaining our, our uh, cost curve uh, to make sure this work is all uh, doable in the long run. And this children's health complexity work that we're talking a bit about today hits on every one of these four uh, priorities for CCO 2.0. So we hope and expect that the work you're going to hear about today at the state level, at the community level, can really help us to better understand and drive these efforts to meet the four goals of CCO 2.0. In addition, we hope that through this conversation today and as you're looking through this work, you'll see how this directly relates to the strategic plan that you have all uh, worked so hard to put forward together for our early learning system in Oregon. Um, we really believe that this children's health complexity work that we're going to outline today can really serve as a key support to many strategies that are identified throughout the strategic plan. We've listed 10 for, for you that really came up for us. These relate to ensuring kids have access to the needed health services, um, to the social emotional development supports, to the parenting and family supports, but also reaching out to those social determinants around housing and uh, particularly addressing the needs of um, uh, families perhaps engaged with the child welfare system. So we expect that there are more strategies that connect to this work today, but we hope that when you're thinking about and hearing this today, um, we'll close out with some questions to you, but how can we use this work at hand to best support the goals of the um, early learning uh, strategic plan? So with that, we're going to dive into the work and uh, the specific data we're finding, and I'll pass it off to Colleen. Great. Thanks, Dana. Well, thanks so much again for having me. As you can tell, um, I was so excited to join today that I was even willing to miss the Padre game, the opening Padre game that's happening literally 100 yards away from me. It was really fun to watch these people partying for a Padre game as I'm carrying my laptop, but this is way more exciting than a party. You should see the tears. So, the <laughs> <laughs> yes, that kind of conference. <laughs> As Dana mentioned, we've been kind of using this term children's health complexity, and that health complexity is really composed of a couple of pieces that combine together to form a more robust picture of that child's health. 
So we thought what we would do is first start off kind of describing what we're talking about when we're saying we're measuring children's health complexities that's based on their medical and social complexity, um, and then talk through the ways we've identified that using system level data, and then share with you the findings for publicly insured children that are zero to five. So the concept of health complexity basically takes into account two different things. One is the medical complexity, and two is the social complexity. And again, the goal for this work was to try to think about what data do we have now? What indicators do we have now that are available to us for all publicly insured children? So for those 400,000 kids, what information and data could we use now to better inform systems and policies? In terms of medical complexity, that's the kind of blue piece of the puzzle. And what that takes into account is that child's um, healthcare utilization. And so it's looking at claims data or services that a child has received, and then looking at the types of services to kind of understand how often are they utilizing services, what kinds of diagnoses does that child have, the number of body systems impacted, so that you can categorize a child into one of three categories. A child that has complex chronic conditions, so that would be a kid, for example, with severe cerebral palsy, a kid with non-complex chronic conditions, so that would be a kid, for example, with well-managed asthma, and then a kid who's generally healthy. But as we all know, medical complexity is just one piece of the puzzle. So for social complexity, what we did is we tried to operationalize and build off the Center of Excellence on Quality of Care Measures for Children with Complex Needs. This uh, was a federally funded effort that uh, pulled from people who have been doing this work for years and years and years. And they have this great definition of social complexity, which defines social complexity as a set of co-occurring individual, family, or community characteristics that can have a direct impact on health outcomes or an indirect impact by affecting a child's access to care or a family's ability to engage in recommended medical and mental health treatments. The important part about this is that when you see the factors, you'll see they're actually very aligned with adverse child events. But the factors that we anchored our analysis to were very specifically anchored to higher health care costs. Again, we were trying to kind of think about how do we identify indicators of social complexity that not only impact that child's health, but actually impact health care costs. And so the 18 factors that we looked and examined whether we could operationalize were all associated with higher health care costs. And then the health complexity, the green puzzle, which is, takes into account both the blue and the yellow to combine the green, is basically a composite of those two thoughts, like to understand how much does a child have medical complexity and social complexity, because we know those two pieces of the puzzle are important. So those are the definitions that we use. Now let's talk through how we operationalize those definitions and then the state level findings for kids zero to five. So let's start first with that leap to the puzzle. So when we use that kind of medical complexity algorithm, it's called the pediatric medical complexity algorithm. When we look at a um, cohort of children that were publicly insured, the hundred of the 145,000 kids zero to five, 16.6% .6 of them would have what's considered a special health care need. So there's 4.7 that have that complex chronic condition, and then 11.9% that had a um, non-complex chronic condition and then 83.4% that were considered healthy. We did examine these analyses across the counties in Oregon and examined them by CCO and saw statistically significant differences in the percentages. So what you see in this map, in this uh, chart is a heat map, which basically shows for that first group, that very chronic complex group, uh, the variations that you see by county in terms of the number of children that are chronic complex. We've also examined the data by race Hold on, and Colleen. by ethnicity. Colleen. Colleen. Uh, yeah. Hold on. Could you give an example of uh, complex and non-complex? Sure. So, again, to get in that top category, you would have to have multiple body systems impacted. You'd have to have high utilization. So a good example is a kid that has a severe cerebral palsy, for example. A non-complex chronic condition would be something like well-managed asthma. Great, thank you. ADHD, example, sure. So again, we saw variations by, by place. Uh, one of the things we really wanted to look at is that, you know, a limitation of system level data, as there is with every data source, is um, you might under-identify kids who live in areas that they can't access health care. Um, and so the reason they may not look at complex is they haven't received services. And we did see that there was one region that's very rural that had lower rates, 
But there's also literature to show that if you have a child with very, very complicated medical conditions, you often have to move closer to the services. So we did not see that all the rural rates, all the rural regions were the regions that had the lowest rates. So in general, this is helpful information. And at a community level, we've been kind of looking at the county level rates and kind of thinking about what they mean in terms of services for kids. One of the nice parts about the data sets is that we can look at it by race and ethnicity. So if you go to the next slide, this shows you that three-part category. So the, the top blue is the kids with those complex chronic conditions, and the orange is the kids with non-complex chronic, and then the gray is the kids that are considered healthy. And we looked at it by race, and what you see is that there is variation in the findings for medical complexity by race. And if you go to the next slide, uh, we're able to look at it by ethnicity. There we don't see as much um, uh, basically significant differences. We do see some differences for those kids that are unknown, which um, partially has some factors around access, which we want to kind of look a little bit further on as we're analyzing and using the data. We'll go to the next slide. You can go to slide 13. I'm trying. We're trying. <laughs> 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 I will just actually press the button. <laughs> press the button. Okay, so that's the purple piece, or that's the blue piece of the puzzle we just talked about, the medical complexity. So let's talk about the social complexity um, piece of the puzzle. So as I mentioned, we anchored our, our work to the definition of social complexity that was defined by the Center of Excellence. And what they did was an amazing amount of work over five and a half years where they did a detailed literature review and found in that detailed literature review on the left side, 12 factors that were associated with higher health care costs that met that definition. So they looked at factors that met the definition, and then the second bar was, do those factors in a healthcare environment, are they associated with higher health care costs? And they found 12 in the literature that were associated with higher health care costs. But then all these experts around the room who have been working in the field for about 20 years said, yeah, 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 I don't care if there's literature. These factors on the right, parent death, uh, criminal justice involvement, homelessness, I think they're associated with poorer health outcomes and poorer health care costs. And so then what the COE did is they were able to do um, to merge analyses similar to what you're going to see in our analyses in Washington Medicaid and Minnesota Medicaid. And they found that the experts were right, that those six factors that are on the right were also associated with higher health care costs. So what we did in Oregon is we stepped back and said, you know what, let's use the broad definition and see of these 18 factors, how many can we find, one, system level data, and two, can we link at a child level? Because again, what we want to do is create that composite story for a child of their medical complexity, which we were able to look at from the claims data that we just showed you, and their social complexity. So then we needed to go and examine, okay, of these 18 factors, which ones can we identify at a child level and create an indicator for? John, do you want to share about the work we did around that? The next slide. Yeah, sure. So one of the ways that we were able to do this actually fairly easily is to utilize a resource that's been available to us for a while, but has really been underutilized as far as generating this kind of information. It's called the Integrated Client Services Warehouse. It's a shared service that we have between the Oregon Health Authority and the Department of Human Services. And um, it was probably started, gosh, probably about 10 years or so ago and has largely been utilized as a repository for administrative data from the various uh, divisions that exist within those two agencies. And largely in doing that has been used to uh, help generate a lot of the forecast information that's used by, those, uh, by the agencies to uh, develop budgets and so on. But um, what has re what the side benefit of that and what we actually utilized it for is is that it is a big repository of a lot of information from across OHA and DHS, and now also actually some data from outside of uh, the mothership over there, which includes uh, like the Department of Corrections. Uh, we're looking at including LEDS data from uh, from the state police, um, maybe housing data, some education data down the line. It's going to be a, a really nice source of information. Um, but what they do in putting all that into a warehouse, since it's all there, they actually create a unique identifier across 
everybody who's in that so that if something came from the Medicaid data set or something came from uh, TANF, um, they're basically placing the same unique identifier on those individuals so that you can look at overlap between those things, uh, which is interesting in and of itself, but for our purposes and doing the kind of work that we're, we're talking about here, what we wanted to do is look at not just the overlap, but the overall, um, and actually create a profile for individuals and their social complexity using the elements that, uh, that Colleen just went over. Uh, one of the things that we had to do in doing that is the, that data warehouse has really a pretty thin set of data from each one of those various um, divisions. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have everything that's associated with the, the data that's in child welfare, for example. It has the identifier and some basic pieces. Um, but what you're able to do is after everything's all matched up, they're able to go back into the originating data and pull in more information. So we spent some time um, actually talking with stakeholders, the CCOs, uh, advocates, families, and so on, and tried to, we explained basically what we had available to us in terms of data for these various social complexity factors, and we used the feedback that we got from them to help us uh, operationalize them, then actually pull the information together. So overall, and I can't remember if Colleen actually said this, but out of the 18 different factors, the social complexity factors, ultimately, ultimately we landed on 12 that we had readily available to us and could easily operationalize out of that combined data set. And we use that information to generate uh, um, for, the, for the kids that we were looking at, which were publicly insured kids, uh, we use that information to generate how much social complexity that they had. And we looked at it from the point of view of, of every single factor actually being additive and didn't necessarily weight any one of those factors any more than any other factor. So if you go to the next slide, you'll be able to see kind of which factors we were able to identify. And again, you probably saw that definition. Some of those factors had nothing to do with the child, but actually had to do with the family. So what you'll see on the left are the indicators that kind of link to those 18 topics I showed you on the slide. And we have five indicators that we could look in the ICS database and say at a child level that we could identify that were related to those 18. So poverty, whether that child access can it, whether that child was ever in foster care, not whether they're currently in foster care, but ever in foster care, whether that child had utilized mental health services, whether that child had utilized substance abuse services, and whether in the claims data there had been child and abuse neglect codes. This one is really important in terms of why we included it. So we included it because, again, we're trying to look at what system level data do we have now that is telling us that these child, this child has social indicators. So we knew that there were a lot of false negatives in the data. So there are kids that have child abuse and neglect that don't have a, a diagnostic claim. But there were no false positives. If a kid, ha if a kid has a, diagnos a diagnosis of child abuse and neglect in the Medicaid claims data, then, in, then they likely had child abuse and neglect. So we wanted to include that because it was giving us an indication of social complexity. So those are the five at the child level. Then as John mentioned, we were able to then link for children to their family, to one, one or both of their parents, to look and see whether um, we could see seven indicators related to that one or both parents. And so again, for the family factors, we had um, whether the parent had ever accessed Tanis, um, whether the parent died in Oregon, whether the parent used mental health services, whether the parent used substance abuse services, um, for limited English proficiency, the growth variable we were able to use is whether at the time at the most recent enrollment of that child in Medicaid, the parent needed information not in English, and then whether that child was eligible for Medicaid uh, based on the parent's disability. So you have seven factors that are based on one or more of the parents. One place that we got a lot of input from stakeholders about was how far back do we look in the database. For some of these variables, they're there for much longer than the child's lifetime. And uh, this is a key place that we got a lot of stakeholder input. And the decision from stakeholders was that we should look the period of that child's lifetime plus the prenatal period. 
So if Johnny is eight, we're looking back nine years to see whether one or both parents had any of those indications that are listed in that family factor category. And then what we did is just combine them together to create a 12-part count variable that takes into account the five from the child and the seven from the family. So if you go to the next slide. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just, hey, Colleen, whoa, whoa. Just, just a really uh -huh. quick caveat on, on that piece, though. There are a couple of the data elements where we did not necessarily have the full history, uh, so we couldn't go back for that history of the kid plus the one year, but that is what we tried to do uh, when it was available. Okay. Yeah, and if you look on the, if you go back, sorry, um, just if people wanted to know the devil in detail of the data, we'll send the overview report after the, the call. But if you look at the data table, can you just go back one slide, probably so. Um, in the table, we tell you if there was any variables that don't map to that prenatal two-year period, we note it in terms of the table. So, for example, the child abuse and neglect, that's for a three-year period not for the full potential lifetime of the child. So, um, and then there's a link at the end that's to our data dictionary. So there is a group of kids that um, in terms of those family factors, we weren't able to link data to because they, there wasn't a good match within the integrated client uh, system. So for the child variables, for the five child variables, those are there for all the kids. For the family variables, we were actually fortunate enough to be able to link 80% of kids to one or both parents. And for most of the kids, it was to both parents. It was to 67.94% of kids. We were able to link for both of the parents. But there is a group of kids, that 20% of kids, that we weren't um, able to link to a child in the ICS database. And there's a lot of reasons for that that we could um, describe when we get to the question and answer period. But I want to make sure we show you the data finding. So in terms of the, the rate for children zero to five, since that's the population you guys are really focused on, in terms of publicly insured children, these are their rates of, of children um, and the kind of whether they've experienced that indicator. So again, this is publicly insured children. Um, and then when you look, it's about a third of kids uh, that they've accessed TANF and, and that their parents have accessed TANF. The most common uh, social indicator that was seen for children zero to five was that 44% of them, their uh, parent, one or more of their parents had accessed mental health services. 29% their parent accessed substance abuse services. 7.4% um, or 10,801 publicly insured kids had been in the foster care system at some time. Um, so this is, I have to say, these kinds of data findings and kind of the implications for what we do in terms of promoting these young children's development, building their health and building their resiliency, um, we'll talk a little bit later. It's just been really helpful to be able to articulate kind of the magnitude of children that have these experiences and the magnitude of services that we're going to need to be best matched for these kinds of kids that are experiencing these types of social indicators. Next slide. As John talked about, you know, each one of those factors is actually really important in terms of its potential impact on the child and how we might build that child's health and resilience. But as you all know, in terms of looking at literature on social determinants of health and adverse childhood events, there is also a cumulative effect that children who experience more of these are more at risk in terms of social complexity. So this is a, a bar chart that's showing you for those kids zero to five, when we look across those 12 factors, how many kids are experiencing zero. So what you'll see is only 24% of publicly insured children have experienced zero, which means the flip that uh, uh, three and four kids have experienced at least one of those social complexity factors. And while the tail kind of goes down over time, the magnitude of children that we're talking about is actually quite large. So if you go to the next slide, um, when we kind of put that, that bar chart into numbers, it's basically a third of children, zero to five, um, have experienced three or more of those social complexity factors. So in terms of numbers, that's 48,753 kids who have experienced three or more of the factors. And when we start to kind of get to those higher tail ends in terms of five or more factors, while it's just 12.4%, that equals out to be about 18,100 publicly insured children. Again, with the analysis, we looked at it by region and saw that there are regional uh, differences. Um, and this is gonna be an important thing that we're gonna really be looking forward to learning from communities about. Um, and just starting to do work with CCOs and earlier learning hubs on using this data, there is a little bit of a chicken in the egg in the sense that um, if you have services and services that people will access, you show up on the system level data, 
But if you don't have services or you have certain populations who don't access services, then you may look less socially complex, partly because we can't see we can't see whether that complexity is there because our factors are based on utilization of services. So for example, we are working with a Tri-County CCO right now and we're seeing we looked at zip code analysis and some of the frontline providers are talking about how some of those services, their Hispanic Latino population has felt very uncomfortable accessing them. So they don't necessarily look as socially complex, but part of that is that population didn't feel comfortable accessing the services we're looking at. One of the things that as we've been kind of working with the front line is, is looking at the clusters. So not only do we want to kind of think about um, maybe prioritizing services for kids that have multiple factors, but are there factors that cluster together? And how might we think about kind of where those car seats are parked in terms of those factors? And so probably not surprising to all of you, what this shows you is um, the, red, the red lines on the top are those kind of family factors that we talked about or those social complexity factors that we talked about. And what this is showing you is the correlation between the two factors. So that you might think about like, well, if we have kids with multiple, are there ones that more, are more likely to cluster together? And what we see is that, and not surprising probably to you, is that mental health and substance abuse cluster together. So as we start to think about potential places to prioritize dyadic therapies, maybe thinking about parents with substance abuse and mental health services might be a good place to start given the magnitude of children who have multiple um, multiple social complexity factors. And go to the next slide. Again, one of the really nice parts about being able to kind of link with the ICS database and uh, the availability of race and ethnicity data in ICS as compared to claims data currently is we can look at variations um, by race. So when we look at for young children zero to five, and the magnitude of social complexity that they have, you'll see that the rates of children who have three or more of the social complexity factors as young as zero to five uh, significantly vary by race. Um, so you can see here in this um, chart, for example, that just one column I'll call out is um, the African-American publicly insured children of them that are zero to five, 48.2%, um, we, we have three or more of the social complexity factors present. Whereas on the inverse of the publicly insured children whose race is identified as Asian, 40.1% have zero social complexity factors. So now let's talk about the composite, the, 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 the goal of creating that kind of combined information. So this is where Oregon was the first state to create a health complexity variable. And so if you go to the next slide, we had this kind of idea where we wanted to create something that was combined. We, need, we know we needed to create a variable that was categorical or it created categories that illuminated both the medical and the social complexity part. We knew that the Center for Excellence found that actually if you have one, you're at higher risk for cost. But we also knew that they found that there was a gradient effect, meaning if you had more, you were more likely to be at higher cost. We also wanted to be able to create public reporting. We wanted to be able to share this information. So it had to be digestible. We couldn't have a 20-part categorical variable because we had to make sure that we were kind of giving something that was easy to digest and also that maintains the data sharing agreements within ICS, uh, given that we're creating county-level reports. So if you go to the next slide, what we landed on what, with a lot of feedback from stakeholders, as John mentioned, is a nine-part categorical variable. So on the left, what you'll see are those three categories in the blue that I talked about. So the top row are those kids with the chronic complex conditions. The middle row are kids with non-complex chronic conditions. And the bottom row are kids that are healthy. Then the, the, the columns, the first, second, and third columns, those are based on that social complexity, that 12-part categorical variable. So the first column is kids that had three or more indicators. The second column is kids who had one to two indicators. And the third column is kids that had no indicators. And again, the reason we did that is one, you saw that about a third of kids had three or more. Two, if you had three indicators, that means you had two of the factors. Um, so you could, if you were at two count, you could basically have TANF twice, right? If you got to a three, that means that you had two of those rows in that table, which meant that we felt like you had a higher level of social complexity. Um, one of the things in sharing this data at the state level and at a county level is I think everyone's pretty stunned when they look at the bottom right corner that um, of publicly insured young children, zero to five, um, only 20% have nothing, have neither social complexity or medical complexity. Um, and that what we know is the kind of buckets of best match services across these nine categories are going to be very different. 
So what you do for that 2% that's in the upper category that has high medical complexity and high social complexity is really different than what you would do, for example, for the kids on the bottom of that column. So the kids that currently have no medical complexity but have already been exposed in the first five years of their life to three or more social indicators. So how might we think about what kinds of best match uh, health and resiliency bills might be there for kids, knowing that each one of these buckets kind of calls for something a little bit different and unique and kind of best match services will look a little different. So the goal of this work was not to kind of create cool data tables, but was to actually give people information to galvanize action. So the sharing that um, has happened and will continue to happen thanks to OHA's amazing leadership in this area is that the data has been reported at the state level. And so after this call, we're happy to share the state level report. The data is also publicly available at the county level. So a number of the hubs that we're working with right now, we're kind of diving in and digging deep on the county level data. Uh, all 15 CCOs also received their CCO aggregate population level report uh, back in December, and they will receive an update to the data in June. And then CCOs also received a child-level data file of blinded variables that give them kind of the categorical variables that I just talked through for their attributed population. So as I mentioned, with some CCOs, we're already looking at kind of zip code analysis or cluster analysis or where are those kids assigned to in terms of practice in order to think about how we might leverage and use this information to better serve these children. So if you go to the next slide, that's kind of where we are now. It's kind of thinking about how do we help communities and CCOs use this information. And we really kind of designed three different tracks around that. One is how do you engage community level partners on the population findings, what they mean, what's missing from them, and what services you have and what services you don't have to address them. And Brenda's gonna share a little bit about how um, in, we've been using the health complexity data to very much galvanize that work. Um, the second track of work is really thinking about how co coordinated care organizations can think about better complex health management and uh, community-based services. And I think the early learning hubs are going to be a really important uh, component of that track. And then the third is how they might think about using a frontline um, health complexity approach with their frontline health care providers. So Brenda, why don't I pass it to you to kind of share about how this data has helped kind of galvanize uh, and move conversations in your community to think about where we're going to be focusing in the next few years. Sure. So um, I guess I would just start with a little bit of context about how we um, got into this work just really briefly. We started um, as hubs were being developed and as CCO transformation work originally started in looking at that metric around developmental screening practice and numbers of kids receiving screening um, at appropriate intervals, zero to three. And we um, knew early on, as most CCOs did, that our numbers didn't look good and we had some work to do. We embarked in partnership together on really enhancing the work around how to get developmental screenings um, completed and um, had another uh, couple of strategies around that where the hub and community-based partners also up the ante on helping parents understand what developmental screening was, what the purpose was, and then um, triage ways to have referrals back to primary care um, for families, so coaching up families to ask for results of developmental screening or to inquire about developmental delay or potential for developmental delay. And so our numbers rose appreciatively as they did in many places of the state for uh, three years and we watched those numbers and we celebrated those numbers. And yet, um, what we, as we were watching those, we were also watching the number of kids coming into elementary school that still were um, basically presenting at kindergarten, not ready to learn, with developmental delay, risk for developmental delay had not been screened or it had screening and not seen follow-up. And so we were watching the work around the state um, and actually started courting Colleen and her um, staff because of the work that they were doing. So we had some concepts around what we thought um, was going on, but we really needed to dig deeper into that and needed the expertise to help make that happen. The Central Oregon Health Council, who is our community arm for our CCO, which is Pacific Source uh, Community Solutions, 
and the Early Learning Hub jointly together um, invested in a year's worth uh, of work to start with, which was a little bit nervous for both Colleen and I. It's a huge amount of work to engage um, partners and to get started down a path of understanding the data and cultivating the data and doing the dig deeper without having some assurance that you're going to go beyond that. However, we were um, fairly certain that given the numbers and the interest and engagement of folks that we could continue that work. So we are looking now at phase two. The phase one work really focused on that cross-sector engagement and we were fortunate enough um, because of the previous relationships I think that we had over the promotion around um, developmental screening to re really have our primary care um, partners um, outlined. Uh, we have two primary care partners in phase one that stepped up to have their data uh, deeply examined and that was a heavy lift for them given um, how their electronic medical records are or have been in the recent <laughs> past. Uh, one is actually actively in transition. And those were Mosaic Medical and for us Central Oregon Pediatric Associates. The two of them were uh, extremely important to us because one, they were um, very much in in this work, but they also served the majority of our publicly insured kids within their pediatric practices across the region. And so that was important. Um, we had uh, that quantitative data from them, um, our early intervention project, which is led by High Desert um, ESD across the region with a component um, through Jefferson County ESD as well. And then, and then um, because the end of our phase one work or as we were making decisions about what our phase two work needed to look like, the health complexity data came on board at just the right time. Sometimes time means everything. Uh, we, uh, with that, we did a ton of interviews. Um, so we had 80 stakeholders that were interviewed uh, within this process, and we pretty heard pretty consistently um, from them that um, families had varying needs, and we saw varying levels of services available. <coughs> and communities and access issues for specific populations. There was a community-specific asset map um, that we started with a framework for, and we used that throughout the interview process to really check our assumptions um, with all of our stakeholders and see, and um, from stakeholder to stakeholder, to see if <laughs> understanding and agreement um, was there, and so that was built out over the course of the last um, almost a year now, uh, by county um, specific, and then uh, identify gaps and resources uh, that could limit follow up. So, so um, we uh, part of the findings of that um, really stood out, I think, for people in terms of how we looked at disparities. As a region, we um, have a hub that has, um, in our population area, that has a lot of services available and a lot of kids um, that are served within that. And then you go out into the um, further regions and services become less and less accessible for a variety of reasons. And so. And so it was important for us to look at all of our data um, and what partners were saying based on that local level. We had two group stakeholder meetings where we checked in with all of them in the same rooms. We um, actually, it's not listed here, but we had a third meeting specifically as the health complexity um, data and our other data all came on board before it was shared broadly with our CCO um, behavioral health director, the medical director for the CCO, um, our Central Oregon Health Council director, our two primary care partners, and early intervention. So nobody would walk into a stakeholder meeting with broader community partners there and have any surprises. Out of that work, um, uh, the phase two proposal um, for what our direction moving forward is um, came um, and those decisions and priorities were set by that stakeholder group at our January 7th meeting. 
So this gives you um, a little bit about the data and how uh, we are using it and the examples um, of how it's moving, the work is moving forward. Our data uh, reveals significant opportunities for improvement and follow-up um, and closed-loop communication um, and identifying better um, match services and supporting families to access those services. So, so um, it really gave us a map, if you will, of seeing where kids were falling through the cracks, which is what our goal was. Um, we knew um, from the get-go and based on um, projects that um, the Pediatric Improvement Project had worked with prior to us that we had a big commitment to working with our um, primary care partners that we had engaged and frankly uh, used a little bit over the, the last year um, to guide this work and it, and it was a huge lift. And so um, in addition to working with those primary care practices and um, early intervention in moving forward in looking at those best match um, services and how those referral networks would work. Uh, we identified areas that had distinct disparities and inequities both by region and by race ethnicity and so a priority about moving forward to identify those. And then um, it really pulled out of the data where kids were less likely to receive a developmental screen so that we could really focus our work in that area. Um, at the very bottom, what's highlighted is really uh, the work around the health complexity data that stood out for us, specific to us as a region, and will guide our work um, moving forward. One in three um, of our publicly insured children had three or more social uh, complexity factors that impacted them. Uh, the most common, as you've heard before, um, similar to the state averages, although a little higher at uh, 50%. So half of our kids have a parent um, that's accessed mental health services. Interestingly enough, and um, I noted in the conversation on the way in an interest about uh, mental health services, as we were developing um, that service map, array map for us, we have very few as a region, even in our um, most rich resource hub <laughs> out of Bend, I might as well name them, um, we have very few um, services that really are focused on mental health for young children or specifically around uh, work with families of young children um, in, in that um, wraparound venue. And so, and so we expected maybe a little bit more and seeing that same trend of as you move out, but for us as a region, that is a huge uh, piece of work. And so we're happy to have access to COHC's work um, with the behavioral health side and the partnership with them um, to actually reach down into how we're going to provide service um, for children at that level. Uh, a slight freeze, we'll get there. <laughs> so, I think, Brenda, I think you, um, I don't, I think you were, we're just going to, because we're frozen here, we're going to just let you close on okay. any, like, <laughs> takeaways of working on this children's health complexity work, and then okay. we'll close out with some questions and conversation with the council. Yeah. Um, so as we worked with partners and really looked at this, what we, uh, what we thought our phase two was going to look like um, really increased significantly <laughs> in uh, ways to address that social complexity work. There, the timing is good for us as a region to use that data, not just on this particular project. We have initiatives that we are partnering with the Health Council on um, traces, trauma, uh, resilience, and ACEs um, is the movement that uh, regionally we are moving on and the step down into what this means for young children and um, the cross nature of the work with our Roots of Resilience project out of um, OSU Cascades 
is going um, to be a big piece of the work. Ah, oh, and look, we're back. <laughs> <laughs> Our four options. So, so we triaged in, stepped in options um, on how we could expand this work in phase two moving forward. And overwhelmingly, the partnership moved toward option four, which meant that they had to be all in. It wasn't what was the hub or this project going to do, it's what are we all collectively uh, willing to do given the data. And so option four talks about the existing pilots, adding in additional pilot sites, and then um, a targeted focus on funding for services that would enhance pathways with limited capacity. Uh, or that don't exist to fidelity. And so that's where uh, part of that work around the behavioral health piece comes in. And then targeted developmental supports for children with high social complexity. So we are just dipping our toe into that and our work on phase two at this point um, is really to uh, assure that we have agreements in place with the partnerships that will help advance each one of those phases of the work. We have um, secured our phase two funding, which made Colleen and I both um, give a sigh of relief, um, knowing that we are firmly um, moving forward with this work in Central Oregon. So, And Brenda, the funding for phase two is from the hub and CCO again? It, it is. So uh, we funded a two-year project where two-thirds of the funding is coming from um, the CCO out of our community-based model. So not on the QUIM side. We have a division of funds because of the way that we're set up, but in the community-based funds um, under social determinants. And then um, a third of the funding coming from the Early Learning Hub, which is in our discretionary funds, but I also have a match in that from our McVee um, system development funds. So thank you, Brenda. I, that was a perfect example. I think we all feel that this work has only been about a year and a half underway with a tremendous amount of planning, stakeholder engagement, data work. Um, and we really see this as the tip of the iceberg of where we are in the opportunity for this work to really help drive forward our statewide goals and the identify goals and needs at a community level. Um, it's really kind of a, a key opportunity to operationalize what we understand to be um, impacts to children from social uh, factors and um, adverse childhood experiences to really have tangible tools to address the needs of kids um, at a population level and particularly drive our focus efforts on addressing disparities. So with that and all that we've heard from Brenda and a sneak view of all the zero to five data, we'd love to open it up, hear your questions, but in particularly we leave you with two questions ourselves. Um, we'd love to know uh, what this data can tell us about how we can better meet the needs of children in Oregon from your council perspective. And then, of course, how can we build on this work at hand uh, to best support the goals of the, the statewide early learning system goals? So thank you for your time. We'd be glad for your questions and would love your input on these. Wow. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, what a lot of information to digest, but also to apply as we move forward. Uh, questions from Council Members Terry. Um, I could barely sit still. I think this is really great data. Um, but I have a, I have a few questions. Um, is the Oregon Center for Children and Youth with Special Health Care Needs involved in this work? Yeah, they've been, they've been a part of the group of stakeholders that have been participating and helping us operationalize the, the work. So. Great. Um, I'm yeah, a, uh, <laughs> hold on just a second. I've got, I've they got, also are needing a grant right now, oh. so they're using the medical complexity algorithm, so we're really aligned on that component okay. of the algorithm. Great, thank you. Um, I'm a little gobsmacked that there is a system that um, has a, a unique identifier for children that's been in place in Oregon for 10 years, considering we've talked about that system at this table for nine years and been trying to build it. So I just want to, I just have to name the elephant in the room. Um, the other thing that I really, I think this is really exciting, but I, I've got to call out this huge disconnect at OHA that data goes to CCOs and doesn't go to other community-based providers. Mm -hmm. I work with two CCOs. They got these reports in December as a local public health director that is on um, the LCAC and the Early Learning Hub. I had no idea this existed. Um, 
and so I would really ask OHA, when you send information about population to um, CCOs, remember that local public health authorities are responsible for the health of the population as a whole, not just the Medicaid population, and send it to us as well, because CCOs are not, they are unique, and they are not, Central Oregon is, is part Pacific source, so is one of my CCOs, and they do not operate the same way, and we'd heard nothing about this, and there are minimal maternal child efforts going on in one of my CCOs, so I would please ask that you, you release it to everybody that has a responsibility for, for um, population health, not just the CCOs, because they're better partners in some areas than they are in others. Gotcha, got that noted. And I, um, Terry, that is so helpful feedback, thank you. Um, in addition to noting, I would say, you know, it was intentional that we created these statewide data maps as well as county-based because we know that the critical partners in the efforts to really move the needle on this work is not just at the CCO level. So that's why we've created it. And the opportunity today is for us to hear from you, how else can we leverage this work to move the needle, uh, you know, within partnerships with CCOs and beyond. So that's, that's great feedback for us. Yeah, and I mean, we'll definitely take that into account when we're distributing the information next time. As uh, we mentioned, we should be updating this information in um, roughly June. And then the plan is, at this point anyway, to update it on a yearly basis as long as it's being thought of as, as useful. Um, so, uh, yeah, hopefully it'll, it'll get more and more. Part of what we're doing right now is making sure people do know about it who maybe haven't heard about it through the other efforts and through the CCOs. Um, but also we'll set up more of a, a web-based presence around the information so that folks are aware of it and are, can be expecting it at a standardized time so one one clarifying question in terms of the unique identifier just to be clear that's within the universe of publicly insured children not all children right right within the universe uh, well so right now it's within the yeah. universe of the data that's within the integrated client services warehouse so to the extent that that includes kids who are outside of publicly insured it would include them as well I mean one of the other pieces of data elements that we've talked about including in this on the medical side of things is our all payer all claims data set which includes roughly 80 percent or so of the people who are insured in the state and if we conclude that information and maybe generate some of the same information it obviously broads it out quite a bit it really depends on the data that's within the the, the warehouse Point being that right now it would be well short of all children. Point being, yes. Yes. I had a, this is fabulous information. I think as we try to look at these populations, the more specific and precise we can be, the more targeted the, the interventions can be. So this is an amazing tool. I had a couple of clarifying questions. It said TANF up there on the poverty data. Did it not include SNAP as well? Um, we had a choice between using the SNAP and the TANF data, and ultimately we went with the, the TANF based off of some of the feedback that we had in those stakeholder meetings. Okay. I think for me, because there's such a <coughs> difference between the two, TANF is people deep in poverty, right? Yeah. So that 30% is striking. Um, so I, that was just a note I wanted to make sure I understood. Sure. Colleen, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, this is a place when we did, um, when we included um, additional programs, it was about 70% of the kids. And when we looked at the data from the Center of Excellence, TANF in itself, like a separate, was the most predictive indicator of higher health care costs. So based on the feedback we got from the group, and also because it was more correlated with higher, higher health care costs, that's why we narrowed down to TANF. Okay, that's, that's very helpful. And I'd just it'd be curious to see the list of stakeholders who you did engage, um, you know, if it sure. was just to see the diversity and, um, sure. and the representation that would be helpful. And then I love the notion of the map and the implementation. I don't know if there's something you can share on the mapping, but it would, could really be a useful tool for some of our local leaders to, to see how you frame the work. One, one of the things um, locally, and it was sort of a challenge, I guess I would say, a challenge to us, when we were looking at how to fund the project is we um, had providers around the table at our CCO stakeholder meetings that said, you know, this work's being done somewhere else. Why can't you just give us a toolkit and we'll follow that and figure out how, 
how um, this looks for us. I would highly advise against that. I think um, locally you don't know what you don't know. We use data that belonged to us. We already had it, but yet we didn't know how to use it in a way that was going to get us, point us to where um, we could really make some differences. And that's going to vary from community to community. But I think, um, to me, the aha moment was that all of our systems um, locally have some work to do around understanding the data they have, they collect, and how to really extrapolate out of it in a way that could help point you um, to some joint work. And this is a perfect example of system development work um, that really has to reach across sectors to make a difference um, for kids and families. There is no one agency or no one program that's ever going to make this better um, for families without us all being on the same page, pointing with the same data, and understanding um, what that means. So we had some capacity building in that area to be done, and I would suggest that anywhere else that takes on this work would probably have a learning curve in that as well. This is Bobby. I have a question about the child level data. So, um, my, am I correct that um, at the CCO level, they actually can tie the indicators to Susie Smith? <laughs> you know, that they really actually, that the rest of what you're reporting is aggregate and that you couldn't identify the child, but at the CCO level, they actually know which child has the cumulative indicators of risk or, or fall into yeah, so categories. So, Bobby, what the, the CCO has got at a child level were three sets of blinded categorical variables. So, the first related to that medical complexity is like for, for Susie, whether she's chronic complex, non chronic complex, or healthy. Then in terms of the social complexity, there were there are three variables for Susie, um, and they're count variables. So um, what her child level count was, what her family level count was, so like a number between zero and seven, um, and then what the total count, so a number between zero and 12. And then for Susie, a health complexity variable, which is where did Susie fall on the nine part variable? So she, High, high medical complexity, high social. Um, what is blinded is you don't know for Susie what went into the count. So you don't know if it was mental health or substance abuse. A number of the services were, you know, were through Medicaid, but that's where, from a data sharing agreement, they needed to be blinded counts at a at a child level, as opposed to the aggregate population level reports can tell you at a population level how many had each of the indicators. Yeah, and the, the only information that went back to the CCOs for the kids were these kids were actually, we pulled the cohort of kids in 2016 and then shared the data, um, obviously later than that, but what we did is we looked at the current enrollment within the CCO and only shared back kids that were currently enrolled in the CCOs at that time, so. Well, it's the, the, the reason, thank you, this is really helpful. The, the, you know, the idea has been that services would be tar additional services yes. would be targeted to children who had these multitude of risks. And this, this just been the general conversation in the state. This is the closest I've seen us getting to it. And so that's what I was trying to understand. So at the CCO level, they know when they see the child that this is a child who follows medical, social health, that, that, that they not detailed, but enough to target this is a child we should be uh, providing additional services. Uh, that's the piece I want yep. to explore. Yep. And the way you see, Bobby, uh, there's kind of a different, there's different levels that the CCOs are starting. You know, they just got this in a very interesting time for them in terms of the RFA, but you know, one of what we've been working with them on is one, just kind of understanding their population, engaging the stakeholders that you heard they haven't engaged yet. 
Two, using that child level data to just look at zip codes. Like, are there regions that there are high groups of kids? Because you might take a community-based, investment-based approach of, like, we need more navigators here or we need better services here. It's also just been helpful, like, when we look at that Central Oregon data and we look at the magnitude of children and then we look at how many providers there are that could provide dyadic right behavioral health services, just not even looking at a child level, it told us, like, whoa, there is a big gap between the number of kids who need dyadic therapy services and the number of providers who can serve children zero to five to provide dyadic <coughs> services. Then there's this next layer that they can say, okay, where are these children, what, what practices are they located, and do those practices have best match set of services for children that have high social complexity, high medical complexity? And then there's this, like, next layer that could be for these kids that have higher, really high levels, you know, what, what, are we already serving them? Are they already in programs? If they're not in programs, then how can we take a trauma-informed approach about how we might outreach to them to understand that family's strengths and resiliencies and also understand whether they need additional support? And so that's a way that, like, kind of down the line, and even now, if, if the kind of appropriate pieces were in place, that you could use this child-level variable to, rather than kind of saying assess all 140,000 kids, you could use it to narrow down and kind of figure out which kids you might outreach to. And that's a place where a number of CCOs are starting now in terms of thinking about how to do that in a trauma-informed way and how to do that so that you're assessing kids that you have services available for them. Okay, so I have one last, I have one last question. Since this data is, um, these data are um, publicly funded children, can we assume that these percentages underrepresent what's going on in our community? Well, I mean, it would seem it would seem like we yeah. could because we know that children of higher income um, also experience a lot of the same traumas that low income. Just you know, anyway, so. Yeah, I mean, okay. that, that's, yeah. that's, that's true in terms of we're missing information off of the, the rest of the kids who aren't publicly insured. And another reminder also, and uh, Colleen brought this up earlier, is this only represents kids who are touching the system in one way or another. If for some reason they're not involved with any of the public systems um, that would end up showing up in the data that we have, I mean, to that extent, they're they're not there either, whether they're uh, publicly insured or not. So, and I would add too, we know that um, you know if it isn't clear, this data set is evolving. Um, we talked about 18 factors identified uh, by the researchers in Washington, and we weren't able to capture all of those data elements in our data set. We probably haven't had all the stakeholders at the table, Liesl. So I think um, we have work to do to build out both kind of what goes in to better understand the needs of children and families, and how do we best utilize that data. I think housing is an example where we know housing is a critical impact to families and children's health, and we haven't captured that in this data set. So I think there's we're, we're at an edge to better understand, and we probably won't, there will always be limitations to this type of system level data, but we, yet we have more ways to move this forward to meet all of the shared goals we have in the state. And okay. check, check me on this, underrepresented in terms of whole numbers, yes. Underrepresented in terms of prevalence, we, we would have to say we don't know, because we don't have. Yeah, we the, don't know what the true yeah. right number is. <clears throat> you know, before we lose this data track, it seems to me that the one of the answers to that second bullet up there is to the extent we can get our agency partners mm -hmm. to help identify what are the data sets that are available that you all are using either individually in your agencies or sharing with other agencies. Mm -hmm. The fact that Terry had never heard of ICS or whatever, I think that's it, um, it is interesting to me. I haven't either, but I'm not as involved in the systems as Terry is. So I don't know if that's something we can throw to measuring success committee and say, can you incorporate that in some of the work you're doing? But I think it'd be really helpful for the council as a whole to have a much better grasp of what are these data sets that you all are using that can add up to how we're gonna implement Raise Up Oregon. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really good point. I mean, to some extent, it takes, you know, stepping back from 
most of these data sets were not created for this type of purpose. Mm -hmm. And you have to step back and you realize, that, oh, you have all this information actually that's really useful that you can use for other reasons. And that's, that's basically what happened with Integrated Client Services Warehouse. It was not why it was developed, but uh, putting a different lens on and looking for information that we actually need to help us solve problems and develop policy. It's like, it's right there in front of us, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's very exciting. And I know I've heard DHS, um, is it? Paul Bill? Pilates team. Oh, yes, yeah. Paul. Yes. Who, who are doing all these analytics as well. Um, yes. He spoke at a children's cabinet meeting. So, and I'm guess housing also mm -hmm. is doing it and ODE. So um, I think, yeah. Miriam, if you could provide some leadership in how do we pull this together, it would be uh, really informative and helpful. And I think to piggyback on that, I think something you said really struck me is as Paul's doing this work for us to become more data informed, there's some skill building for our folks leading at the local level of how do I use data to implement changes on the ground. And that's a skill. It's, it's not something that just happens because now you have data. And so I think if we can collaborate across agencies and with you know, folks like community action agencies and housing authorities, how can we coach and lead and, and help the local leaders lead this work? Um, I think that's something we could do collaboratively as well. Yeah, great we point. Lead it as a I just, um, I, I think I, I think this came up at our last children's cabinet meeting, but I just want to continue to do the call out about um, when we're thinking about how we look at the social complexity factors and we look at it by race and ethnicity, that I think that the system has to do more work on better disaggregation by race. I really, really worry about lumping Asian category and then saying that there's, you know, there's this 40% uh, have no um, social factors. And like, what does that look like if we were to look at very specific populations within that category? So I know that that's not a, we need to figure that out here in this meeting, but just as a kind of a broad systems thinking, we all, including our agency, uh, has to do better work about how we're really disaggregating this so we can really figure out if we're meeting the need because I guarantee you there are some disaggregated communities in here um, who, who probably fall in this three or more category. So. Latinos. Yeah. Yeah. Latinos. Yeah. 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 Miriam? Yeah, that was uh, something I wanted to build on that and then make another comment. Um, I, I guess I'm, for the zero to five population sort of um, Wondering particular, I mean, I see if I'm understanding correctly, right, you could get TANF, if you're getting a TANF child-only benefit, you would show up here on the indicator, which more sort of children of immigrants may be more likely to get, but still not really. So I guess when I look at the whole list, I just worry that for um, children and immigrant families that limited English proficient, or whatever the actual link, limited English proficiency, might be the only one, and there's a cut like the thresholds then for social complexity are one to two, kind of in that category. So I'm just just how and then given that you've already seen racial disparities in social social complexity, sort of how to account for when you think about Latino kids who may be overrepresented by having in a you know in, I mean who may that even if you looked at them who would probably have more foreign born parents yeah. who would not be accessing a lot of these services mm -hmm. um, either because of actual eligibility barriers are perceived that's a, and so I'm not sure if that's a I know to the point I mean every time I hear this I just learn so much more and there's like probably ten things I'm gonna I want to say but I'm not going to um, but <laughs> just wanted to since yeah. Chelsea brought it up just point that out and have a solution but if that's something that's happening at community, if that could be fine-tuned more at a community level, or if that's, you know, if there's a lever at the state level, or it's looking at all these other data systems, just right. sort of how to how to represent that, I don't know. Um, but just wanted to call that out. Um, I think the other piece, and I think it started to go into the some of the issues that um, Bobby was raising, as you think about the sort of rollout of this work and kind of at the community level, and really appreciate you being here, Brenda, talking about bringing that voice in about how you're using it. Um, it seems like an area for the council is, um, and there will be levels to this, I get, but where those service gaps are is probably a good area for us to be. I mean, when I look at what some of those social complexity indicators are, except for TANF, 
not those other ones aren't going to get you to the top of any one like wait list for any for example early care and education services maybe slightly different for home visiting and so I just think that there's an opportunity there both as you're thinking and I don't know yet how you'll start to really it, it sounds like it'll be community to community how you start understanding where those service gaps are there will be many layers to this and then actually getting children's services I agree um, but um, that's an area I think where the collective I mean, I'm looking at Candace and thinking about if there are opportunities for additional resources for the EI, ECSC system, or services like Early Head Start, how are we understanding where you're seeing some of those service gaps? Um, is it maybe a, a good place for, I think, the agencies and the council? Um, and that seems like it might be one of the first places you go, right, from this work. And that was, I guess, my question to answer your two questions for us to think about with a question is, what's the next best as you think about how this work is evolving what's the next best time for you to come back to the council or with what or do you have <coughs> ideas about particularly if you'll be getting some of that information like through the rest of this year on kind of where our service gaps or where are you seeing those gaps or just even just lack of programs for what you're seeing in terms of needs or okay. is that a good <clears throat> place to come back or is that next at the <clears throat> next year is that like Next month. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a great question. I, I think, you know, plus or minus, you know, six to 12 months. I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of, you know, we are just getting this data out. Mm -hmm. We are starting to support um, some funding and technical assistance that OPIP can deliver to partners in the community. There's other efforts being done funded locally. And I think uh, we'll start to really see both, you know, as that work unfolds and as we get into, um, you know, outside of our CCO procurement and really diving into this work with our CCOs more directly, mm -hmm. um, I think that's where we're going to really start to have more information on both the opportunity and some of the gaps mm -hmm. with this work and where we might need, uh, you know, further input on where to go. I think, um, you know, in terms of producing further data, I was looking to you. I mean, we, we um, the initial funding to support this work that we didn't, should have mentioned and thanked the Lucille Packard Foundation for supporting this work is just finishing up, but we are committed as an agency and our health analytics team to continue to both develop this data reports and develop it out further. And we have a lot of work to do with our partners here and, and broader to think through how to do that strategically. So for sure in the next six to 12 months, and if we get more poignant about when is the best time, we can certainly loop back with you to okay. discuss that. Did you have anything to add? Um, the thing I was going to add, and I think Colleen <laughs> probably has some stuff too, is I mean, definitely after we update the stuff in June, and, and to kind of really emphasize the point that Dana was just making, this was our first run at the information. Uh, we'd like to do some validation of the information. We wouldn't expect it to have changed that much when we update this. <coughs> if we start seeing wild changes, I mean, that might be a bit of a red flag for us, because, but we are operating off of some pretty good uh, a theoretical basis and research that have been done about these particular factors. But us putting it together in this particular way and presenting it in terms of health complexity is the really novel, unique piece here that we have going on. Um, I think Colleen could talk some about, you know, she's been reached out to from the state of Washington to replicate some of this work up there and some other efforts. We want to tie some of this information to uh, test uh, some of the, the, the theoretical basis that it comes from to look at, you know, these kids in theory should be very high cost kids and we should be able to see that in the data that we have. We'd like to look at, do some of the kinds of uh, statewide analysis that's been going on at the communities where we're comparing it to some of the metrics that we're looking at. Um, we spent really this past year and a half all around the development side of this. And now we'd like to start applying it to some of the practical pieces in addition to the communication, getting, doing the technical assistance out to the communities. Uh, and Colleen, did you have stuff you wanted to add to that? Sure, yeah. So Miriam, I think you're asking, I mean, I think some of your follow-up was really around um, what do we know about, given this is the magnitude of children that have health complexity zero to five specifically, what are we learning about the gaps in services mm -hmm. for them when we're thinking about asset mapping? And so 
you know, I do think there is some learning that OPIC could share with you, having done this in 10 communities in this state, that there is, there is some uh, gaps in services for children with health complexity that have been identified in all 10 counties, mm. that I would feel pretty comfortable saying, uh, at this point, it seems like this is a consistent gap. Um, and there, so I think there's threads that OPIC could share based on our very myopic work around zero to five with communities that we could share with you in terms of what's bubbled up. I also think that the June update in the data and alignment with CCO 2.0 is going to be really good in the sense that there are a lot of things in terms of CCO 2.0 policy for zero to five and a lot of ways in which this data could be used to galvanize important conversations that would get us to some of that um, uh, understanding about uh, services, gaps in services that I think you're interested in. So I agree with Tina that I think also in a year we're going to be at an interesting place because um, the CCOs will be diving in deeper on that. I do also think in terms of uh, within measuring success, there's ways that this data could be used more strategically to kind of think about some of that gap analysis and the role that early learning system has. So I think there's ways we can get you some information now and then be strategic. We did mm -hmm. uh, receive funding last week from Lucille Packard to continue the work broadly to work across CCOs and then to potentially dive into the three although that's not specific to zero to five. So I think one of the things we can do is make sure that we're keeping our eye on what we're learning to zero to five and how we might share that back with mm -hmm. you as well. Great. Okay, great. We need to wrap up. Okay. I think just uh, one uh, really quick, just a follow-up. It sounds like, too, that um, you've, as you shared, hubs are really key here, too. Mm -hmm. So even in this, like, year period and to, I think, Liesl and Terry's points about how information is, is shared and how we're building capacity communities, that might be a place where we can think about work together mm -hmm. next year. Okay. And with all the money that um, Liz is going to have through launch, we'll yeah. set. <laughs> yes. so, yeah. For that one community. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so thank much, you Dana and, and John and Brenda and yeah, Colleen on the phone. Uh, very exciting work that you all are doing. So. If we yeah, could just validate Colleen yeah. and folks yeah. like that yeah. would, yeah. That would yeah. be helpful, yeah. wouldn't it? <laughs> Thank you, Colleen. Thank you. All right. Thanks <laughs> very yeah. much. Go enjoy San Diego, Colleen. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thanks much for calling in. All right, we have no public testimony, so we aren't as far behind as one <laughs> might think we are. Uh, rules update. This um, is not a new agenda item for us, but it'll be <laughs> really exciting to yeah. finalize this. Yeah. So, Don and Angela. Welcome. Anne. Anne. Oh, Anne. Sorry. Yeah. I was on the next <laughs> one. Sorry. Don and Anne. Welcome again. Yes. So <laughs> what are we going to make permanent? <laughs> Um, yeah, so this is our third um, presentation and hopefully the last on these uh, temporary rules that we need to make permanent. Um, as a refresher, I believe you have uh, the entirety uh, of the rules and track changes at least emailed um, to you. Apologies that they're so large. The changes yeah, themselves are incredibly email. small, uh, yeah. but spread out. <laughs> and so you'll see in that um, the deletions are in red. Uh, the insertions are in blue, um, and anything that's highlighted in yellow was not originally in the temporary rules as approved by the council, but have been identified as places to um, find those additional improvements um, and make them permanent now without having to go through a temporary process. Um, so as a refresher, we've got sort of five areas of, um, of topics to make permanent. Uh, the first is essential background registry. This updates the statutes on um, what are disqualifying conditions to align with the um, CCDF requirements. Uh, this was approved as temporary on September 30th, as I'm recalling. Um, and also includes um, expanding subject individuals to include uh, any program that's participating and is not able to be licensed at this time to make sure that they're going through a continuous background check process. 
um, safe sleep is to correct the uh, filing errors and inconsistencies to permanent rules that had been already adopted. Uh, they were approved over uh, October and September, I believe, um, and relate to the terminology used on safe sleep surfaces, uh, making sure that's consistent throughout, um, uh, making sure it's consistent that um, infants cannot remain asleep if they're brought in uh, asleep in a car seat, that they need to be moved to that safe sleep yes. surface. Um, and then also confirming that um, the Office of Child Care has the ability to send notifications to parents of infants should there be a violation of the safe sleep practices found. Um, center Aid One trainings uh, clarify that um, Aid Ones are required to have pediatric CPR uh, before starting and just complies again with CCDF requirements there. Um, our lead testing requirements were my first uh, take on the rules. <laughs> I always feel like I have a special place in my heart yes. for that. <laughs> um, and um, this was clarifying and moving into its own section, the lead testing requirements previously adopted by the council, um, and also updating the uh, guidance from the EPA to the 2018 version there. Um, and then finally, one that was not originally part of the temporary rules, but we found in doing this review um, related to the governor's directive on parent information, moving uh, the requirement that um, providers post any uh, non-serious <coughs> compliance letters or valid complaints for 12 months, um, which is a requirement that's in rule, uh, specifically under the area saying that that must be in clear view of the parents. Mm -hmm. uh, we looked back and saw that that was the council's intent, and due to a numbering error, um, it had been posted into the rules as permanent, but not in the correct section. Uh, so we made that correction there. Any questions? Okay, any questions from council members? I am going to be looking for a motion. Okay. Eva is moving that we adopt these temporary as permanent rules. I'll second uh, that. Thank you, Terry. A discussion. Those in favor say aye. 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 Am I still a voter? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any opposed or <clears throat> abstentions? All right. Thank you very much. We are excited to be not seeing that in April. <laughs> 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 but we're also excited work, to have though, the rules right. <laughs> updated and accurate and permanent. Let's move that now. We'll invite Angela <laughs> to come forward um, along with Don, who just left but back is coming up. back. <laughs> and this is on the Child Care Safety Portal Ad Hoc Committee. Um, council members, you saw in the packet that was sent out that um, the letter that we received from the governor asking us to move forward in this direction and appoint this ad hoc committee. And then also the staff's draft of what a charter for this ad hoc committee um, might look like. So Don and Angela will give us some more background. Miriam, I don't know if you want to frame this up at all. And then the expectation today, council members, is that we're going to take action and formally um, approve moving forward with appointing this ad hoc committee. So that's what we're heading for. Yep. That's okay. Well said. Yeah, I think Angela and Don, you can give the background, and then I think we'll hope to answer any questions through the discussion. Um, and then, as Sue said, take the action to form the committee. All right. So, um, hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, as was stated, we are um, hope, uh, looking to start a child care, child care safety portal ad hoc committee that will really help um, the early learning division um, make decisions regarding improvements that we'd like to make to the child care safety portal. Uh, the, the portal itself was launched in 2017 in uh, response to um, CCDF requirements that are coming to us through um, block grant funding. That's uh, a large, extremely large portion of our Office of Child Care um, funding. And part of the uh, CCDF requirements included uh, um, several pieces of information um, that we needed to release out to consumers of child care programming. 
and um, the child care safety portal itself is a response to a few of those uh, elements or those requirements uh, specifically uh, search features that families can search for licensing history on child care facilities and uh, also several expectations that we are uh, providing information around um, key uh, safety uh, key data points related to safety so the Early Learning Division launched, launched that, um, the portal in 2017, and um, we, after that launch, have experienced a, um, some challenges around ensuring accurate data transfers and some challenges around um, decisions that have to be made related to the type of information we're sharing on the portal. Uh, uh, without going into detail, it's really decisions around specificity of data, um, because in many ways what is there now in the interest of trying to get as much information out to families is, is going above and beyond the CCDF requirements. So, um, and we really want through this committee to really make some collective decisions about that type of information, how long out we go, how specific it has to be. Can I just uh, give a quick example to that, sure. Angela? So yeah. for example, one issue is um, information going back three years about facilities or going back 10 years. So we have the ability right now, we can go back 10 years, but there are some some challenges with that in terms of the accuracy of the data the farther that you go back. So that's an example of the CCDF requirement is three years. Currently, right now, we're going 10 years back. Right. Thank you. So I, this ad hoc committee is really uh, will help us uh, the um, ultimately via the, this council make recommendations and ultimately make decisions around those types of uh, those types of challenges that we're facing in the interest of imp making improvements to the child care safety portal because of changes that we make on the portal must be informed by these really critical decisions about how much information how long is it there um, and then also guiding the to a certain degree um, any input on some other basic elements of the portal. Um, but really, these policy decisions are the focus. Uh, and uh, just a couple of other background pieces. So in relation to just the challenges that we have kind of come, have come to light since the launch of the portal, um, we, uh, the Early Learning Division is also about to, um, in a very excited and innovative uh, approach to licensing and the work that we're doing for for um, children and families through our, our supporting our child, child care programs. Um, the, uh, we are launching a new data system. I, I'm not sure if you've been hearing about this probably already LS, before yeah, the early yeah. learning information system. And that system has, launching of that system has been, um, you know, taken quite a, has come across its own road, roadblocks and challenges and um, while the team has been working diligently to address them and to really get this into a nice space and that will be uh, very functional, functional is the hope, um, and released soon, that data system will uh, uh, provide the, the data source for the portal once it's launched. So given that high, very important change that's about to happen, uh, we also would love the opportunity to have a, a group to look towards in the event that we also want to maybe inform some, get some information from that group regarding any of that changes. Uh, but really the focus is the policy decisions. <laughs> um, anything else you would like to say? Um, I don't I, I don't think so. I, mean, I, I think the only thing I add is, is this um, ad hoc as um, you'll see in the charter. Is, is really addressing some key policy decisions, knowing that there's a lot more work to go into as we really think about the launch of a new data system and continuing to provide information that families need. Right, and the launch, this says soon. Um, my understanding is it's April. It, we're, we're looking, we don't have an, we have a go, no go list that we're going, so we're like weeks from, so we don't, we're looking in April, but we have to make sure that all the critical pieces are set in place before we're able to do a launch. Okay, we have been, we've heard of Ellis before, so um, we're very excited. Yeah.
to know that it's Everybody. going to happen yes. yeah. this year. I, I would, I mean, I just in the interest of sharing, we have done uh, training with staff who are very excited and as they've gotten familiar with the system um, and the new expedite forms that is going to allow them to go out and do their checklists and other documentation out in the field mm -hmm. right on their tablet. So um, that's, that's how close we are to launching as we have trained staff. So yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I think the go no go list is really about like when do you turn the lights out on Chris yeah. and feel like operations it won't impact kind of the field work and you know create any any challenges yeah. but it's I think very very close and I think as Angela was saying um, that it is once that is the data source that's feeding the portal right there will be some some changes to some look and feel of the portal, how frequency things are updated, as well as there's already been planned work uh, to enhance the same um, vendor that's been building Ellis has built the part of the portal around the facility search. And so they've been really focused on Ellis, but they will, they will also be moving to some, some enhancements that again are around sort of look and feel of the portal and frequency of information. What um, we will, those things will continue to move forward and this ad hoc committee will be apprised and updated regularly mm -hmm. um, about that. Um, but this ad hoc committee will be really focused um, I think as Angela and Don had said, and as, as, as made very clear in the charter, really around um, you know what is the information, some of the some of the key policy decisions around the information that is available on the portal, and that um, nothing will be changing relative to that. So, you know, in terms of information, the major decisions around what information is shared or not shared won't happen until this committee is able to give recommendations to the council. And the council takes action. So some nicer okay. things will happen with the so, portal, but not, you know, any major policy decisions. Um, so let's look at the charge, the charter. Yes. Or whatever. Yeah. So I think that probably we've touched on a number of the principles there. I think you'll see here the um, committee structure um, is, um, is something to call your attention to. I think a number of... Um, uh, folks here on the council um, would help to fulfill these requirements or I'm sure would have recommendations um, on, on different committee members. Um, so I think we, um, as we hopefully we will get, um, be able to uh, leverage your resources and, and ideas about um, both are there people that are not represented here that you think would be important as you're reflecting on the charge of this ad hoc committee and or if you have um, recommendations on specific individuals, I think the ask would be to, as a follow-up, make sure that you are emailing those to Angela. Um, okay, so let me just start, let's use this um, charter as sort of our discussion draft. Um, comments or questions about the charge of this ad hoc committee? Why don't we start at the top and we'll just move through this. Any questions about that? Okay, as far as the principles go, I think they're pretty clear. Yes, I have Terry. A question. So as I'm looking at the charge and the information that's related, related um, and I did look at the portal, uh, the the website, the tutorial that you sent us. I'm like, oh, I have no language. Um, the only thing I'm thinking about is um, local public health is required to inspect some um, child care facilities for health issues. And so um, that may be helpful to have um, a local registered environmental health specialist um, or supervisor participate in this around the health. I know there's. Uh, there's been some disconnect between the licensing specialists and what public health is required to do mm -hmm. and the communication to um, inspectees around that. So, Great. Thank you, Terry. Okay. Helpful. Thanks, Terry. Great suggestion. All right. If there are no additions or comments on the principles, how about the committee structure, which is obviously what Terry um, Terry's comment will re 
uh, be a part of this. Um, we don't want a committee Chair of Miller, 50. So, Martha, I have comments on committee structure. Yes, go right ahead, Martha. Okay, two things. Um, law enforcement officials, district attorney. Uh, district attorneys are law enforcement officials. So um, you could combine that or unless you want to specifically call out, I, um, <laughs> yeah, DAs are law enforcement. Um, and then the second comment is that uh, you may want to add in somebody from DOJ, from the Attorney General's office on this as well. Those are my comments. Thank you. Martha, we'll, we can clarify local um, police, I think. Um, I think we're trying to get um, who we may be routinely working with, so we would specifically want a DA, and I think in addition to a district attorney, we a would detective. want a representative. Mm -hmm or a detective or somebody from local police. Police or sheriff. Too. Police or sheriff. Okay, so what really happens um, in these areas is that um, <clears throat> your law enforcement, police, sheriffs, they'll go out and they will, um, they will do their finding and actually turn it over to the district attorney. So it's a little more complicated than just the police. Um, you have sheriffs that have to deal with that more right. in a rural area. But so your we'll district do police attorneys or are sheriff. the ones that make decisions. Yeah. The DAs are the ones that make the decisions. Right. Yeah, we want both. We want a police or a sheriff and we want a DA. Then what I would do is combine that and pull out that you want or put law enforcement officials instead of that, put chief and or sheriff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I, think, I, I know it's minor, right. but I work with them all the time, <clears throat> and yeah, you need to clarify that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Or, or, yeah. Okay, we will make that change. Other comments on? Thank you. Yeah, Donald. And then DOJ. Oh, oh. Yes, Sorry and DOJ. To, um, yeah, and and somebody out of uh, the Attorney General's office. I feel strongly about that. Are you calling those as two different yeah. things or so the same? That's a good question. She said they were different. When you say uh, DOJ, you mean someone from the attorney, the attorney general's office, right? Yes. Okay. Um, they have um, departments and so that would probably cover this. Well, not probably. They do. Right. This is Bobby. Uh, uh, I, I'm worried that um that people well i guess if they turn us down they turn us down I, th this is we're we're thinking of six uh, six meetings and it's a pretty heavy lift <laughs> do we really think somebody from the attorney general's office would volunteer uh, that's that's what's mm -hmm. going through my head okay, yep. but we could put the category in and if they turn us down they turn us down so that Bobby, that's exactly it. You need to ask them. Um, okay. Um, yeah. We have our um, we have our DOJ, um, which we can I think make clear in the charter um, that well in the in the sort of this background document that we're looking at um, uh, attorneys um, in an advisory capacity, and I think then we can explore if there is somebody on the committee, uh, formally, officially, from the Attorney General's office. Or if we use them informally. As right, well, I think our, we can definitely, we'll, we definitely. If you pay them, they'll always show up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they'll definitely be available in an advisory capacity around yeah. clarifying our, you know, statutes and requirements to this committee, as we've listed a number of other um, uh, technical experts, so. On the yeah. Oh, no. So you might as well include them up front is, is my point, rather than thinking that they are accessible to us. I mean, if this is governor's recommendation and request, um, I, there will be somebody that would sit on it. Uh, yes. Donelda? Yeah. On the parent representative, I understand about the one that has a tragedy because you want to... But it seems like we also would 
I think it would be good to have a parent that's a strong advocate for child care because mm -hmm. we're talking about what's helpful to families, you know, accurate information, mm -hmm. just that general component as well. I understand if somebody's experienced a loss, we want to be sure that doesn't happen again. But what we're trying to do is promote child care as well and the mm -hmm. safety right. components of that. And I, I've heard some real good parent advocates mm -hmm. in some of our work. I I, that is our intention, Donalda, oh. is to have more than one parent. Mm -hmm. Okay, because yeah. this just says a parent with a no, It says parents, oh, parents including. 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 Yeah. Okay. Sometimes we have Okay. okay. Um, Eva and then Shauna. Can we add um, a civil rights expert? I just, um, I know that the, um, the providers, and I know we'll have provider representation, but I think that some of them have been concerned about some information that is, uh, you know, made available online, and so having somebody to have, you know, that kind of perspective about what, you know, you know, how do we get, how do we get what we need, what's useful, what's helpful, but not it violating people's civil rights. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, and I get that we want to have the perspective, too, of uh, law enforcement and DA, um, but I really think it's also important to have a lens for, you know, you know like the other side of things, too. Civil rights or privacy? Yeah. Um, pri maybe privacy, but, you know, privacy, I mean, I can check with any number of people mm. I work with on other issues to see what would what would be the right uh, the right perspective or person to have. Mm -hmm. But you know, I just I just worry that it's you know if if we if we have you know a a large number of law enforcement broadly, it'll just get very one sided and um, I don't you know. And I get the concern. I'm not trying to stop having that from having that perspective. I just think that we need to have a balance there. From maybe that's the area where we could ask um, Department of Justice and Attorney General, like for because there are different areas of expertise here. Is mm -hmm. it's sort of I think public records um, might get it some of what you're talking about or, pri or privacy. Um, there, we do need some expertise in DOJ around like interpretation of kind of like our statutes and, and somebody that's sort of familiar with with our work as well. Um, there, a lot of the information, um, I know one of the areas that they'll look that this um, group will look at is related to um, information that we have um, from DHS, um, CPS around cases. So, so yeah. there's 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 issues there with the confidentiality of that information. So, so I've been hanging out with public defenders, so forgive me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I I think you know if if you know, and and. AFSME represents the attorneys at DOJ, too. So um, uh, I would say that while they would have that perspective, there's still the perspective of the state because their role would be to uphold anything mm. else. So I, what I'm trying to get at is how do, we, how do we ensure privacy issues are handled, you know, for somebody who might be an accused or going through the investigation process on the other side, not just representing the the enforcement side. So could you make a, is there, are you thinking like ACLU yeah. or somebody yeah, like, okay, ACLU could you, I guess, because we have, I think we'd look to ask me or a CIU yeah. or somebody for you to recommend your contact. Yeah. I, I think maybe I want to push back on that okay. a little bit because I, I, I think I'm personally, as an individual, I'm less interested in, and you know, reading the governor's charge to us. I think I'm less interested in sort of weighing things and figuring out of a range of things that we could do that are legal. We may we may choose not to do things mm -hmm. that are al allowable, mm -hmm. versus how do we accomplish the six principles mm -hmm. to the maximum extent that we're allowed to by law. Mm -hmm. Which to me strikes me more as a DOJ advice question than a, a balancing perspectives kind of mm -hmm. question, just for my part. Mm -hmm. I'll 
I'll just say I I support Eva's assertion about needing the balance because we have enough trouble getting people to be child care providers now. And I really believe if things go on a portal <clears throat> as things are in process and we haven't really been thoughtful about what goes on to protect the confidentiality of the child care providers in the process of being investigated, we're going to have just even more, more child care providers going underground and that frightens me. Um, I just think asking for the balance, I mean, whatever decision we come to at the end may be, you know, we're going to put everything up that we legally can put up, but I think just hearing the perspective um, at the committee level would be important. So um, I've, I've made notations here so far around um, Put the clarification around law, the term law enforcement officials, addition of local public health. Um, I think we need to think about the different probably areas of law or legal expertise that will either be on this committee or sitting um, at, or, or in an advisory capacity. And then I think we could say some, um, but in addition to the provider, provider representative, somebody that could bring a perspective around you know, confidentiality issues um, from a provider lens, and we can um, consider that more as we go forward. I think I also just want to say um, that the, again, considering the charge, we are, um, we, we do really want to adhere to these principles. We want to make sure around that this committee is well informed and has access to experts and that can hear multiple perspectives around what is ultimately going to be useful for families in terms of what is, um, uh, posted on the portal or not. Um, and I think that as just, I would offer this at, to, for folks that maybe are trying to think about this and for you, Eva, given what the issue that you're raising, I, in, in what I have experienced, I have not necessarily experienced law and, uh, you know, partnering agencies or law enforcement to come at this from a put a lot on the portal. So I, I, I think that we're really, um, what we want to do by their representation on this committee is really understand what are the confidentiality concerns or issues or implications or their perspective given their mission, um, particularly in very serious cases where they are involved um, and where information will be placed on the portal. What is their perspective relative to what um, helps or hinders the work that they need to do ultimately in their investigations. So that's really the lens that we're asking law enforcement to sort of, I think, kind of show up at the table is help this committee understand that relative to some of the decisions that they will consider. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, but the focus is, again, um, really on, on what is going to be ultimately really um, most useful to parents um, and what we can is clear and accessible and easy for them to understand is relevant. Um, right now, the approach is to share as much information as you know we have based on our current understanding around what, um, what we can share and when, and that's some of what this committee is going to have to review, and that's why we need law enforcement sort of helping us. No, that totally makes sense, but I just also, yeah. Well, I, I think w as the discussion was happening, I mean, I think it might be useful to revisit adding a principle around balancing privacy and transparency, because that's, that's I think, the conversation that we're, that we're talking about having among membership. But I think if that was a guiding principle, that might help ensure this conversation what, <clears throat> stays top of mind. <clears throat> Excuse me, Lisa, what was your wording on that? Balancing privacy and transparency. I also think that applies to the parent or right. a, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. if exactly. anything. Absolutely. Because sometimes in a small rural area, everybody knows everything. And, well, sometimes? Or, well, well, <laughs> even for in the in-home child care is like if yeah. they're providing the care for the neighbors yeah. and so people talk but about Rumors get started. So I think that so that the parent doesn't feel put upon as well. Right. Or, their privacy has been breached while something is being evaluated. Yeah. Or even if it's posted, everybody says, oh, we know who that was. Mm -hmm. Right. We don't want that to happen. Yeah, I get that. We can, we can definitely do that. I, again, I think we'll have access and we'll clarify all of the different 
perspective, the areas of law that we'll need represented here. And our, I think our partner agencies will also bring some of that expertise. But we're we're um, we're not going to, you know, I think we're in a good place of of having access to the kind of experts for this committee that we're not going to put information on the portal that's going to violate people's privacy or so that their rights around privacy and confidentiality. <clears throat> okay. And I think Liesl's word balancing is, you know, the operative word. <laughs> there are going to be different sides to all of these conversations. Um, any other comments or suggestions about the um, committee structure? Yes, Shauna. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> with the committee structure, with parents and child care providers, I, this is like a huge list, and that's going to be a lot of input and a lot to handle. So I want to be very mindful and respectful of that. But as we do look for parents and child care providers, just to be mindful that this also includes after school care and children outside the range of the children that we serve, and to at least try to find people that have that perspective and previous experience, if not current experience, to make sure that that perspective is seen. And also just to make sure we have the in-home providers and we have the large center providers and we're, and we're making sure that we touch on the different types of providers and parents who've experienced different types of providers. Yes. Yes. There are lots of categories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're now at a committee of 25. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> there's going to have to be a balancing here yes. as well. I, assume the council's aware of that. Um, any other comments on that part? Um, I want to just draw attention on, it's the second page, but it's still under the, um, the committee structure that we're um, going to be providing, or at least offering, to provide compensation for parents and child care providers um, in order to facilitate their participation. So that will be an important part of this as we try to figure out dates and times and frequency. Okay. Um, I think we've covered background. Right. Yep. Yes, I think we have. So any other comments um, on this ad hoc committee, the charter, questions? If not, I would love to have a motion that we adopt this with the additional information that's been provided um, at this meeting and move forward. Chair Miller, I move that we authorize an ad hoc committee uh, to outline. Great. Thank you. And Pat seconded. Thanks, Martha. Any further discussion? If not, those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Um, any opposed or abstentions? All right. Thank you, Council, and thank you, Angela and Don. We're you. really looking forward to this new committee. All right. Uh, raise up Oregon implementation. Wow, that's been on our agenda before. We actually have time to talk about it this time. Session. So, is that the implementation? Yes, that's implementation. Oh, okay. All right. Tab six. Legislative session. There are a few bills on here. I'll just quickly run through this, and I want to give time to our uh, colleagues from our agency partners to give any updates they'd like to share. Um, Miriam updated you on the council bill, House Bill 2262. That's currently been referred to the Senate President's office and will then end up in the Senate committee. Um, we're anticipating it'll be um, Senate education. Um, so our main bills that we are carrying right now are House Bill 2024, um, and that's Baby Promise. And um, it has been, uh, it 
received its public hearing and work session within the House Human Services Committee, and it's now been referred to the Joint Committee on Student Success. Um, the same goes for House Bill 2025. Um, it had its hearing and work session with the House Education Committee and will also be the Joint Committee on Student Success. Um, House Bill 2027 is currently up for a hearing and work session on, um, to, on Monday, April 1st. Um, we've been working with DHS on some amendment language and um, should be seeing that uh, a draft three amendment by tomorrow. Um, so really working to get that one done. And then I want to draw your attention it's a few pages down. Um, House Bill 3394 on the last page of bills. Um, that's a new bill that um, Representative Kenny Geyer helped us with and Representative Lively has sponsored that would just allow us to make some corrections and changes to the child care resource and referral entities. And so this does a small technical change in terms of their uh, requirements and duties from an and to an or. Um, so, for instance, PSU doesn't have to function the same way a, a CCRNR in a community would function. The other change we've made is um, we're suggesting that the match requirement be removed since we've been hearing from particularly smaller CCRNRs that as they get access to additional funding, um, it's becoming increasingly difficult to match all of those funds. Um, and so that will be removed from um, statute and we'll continue to work with them on expectations around that moving forward. So those are the main bills <clears throat> I wanted to highlight. Um, as of right now, we haven't been asked for any new presentations at Joint Committee on Student Success, although we're anticipating that will start <coughs> happening as these bills move through them. Um, but yeah, I wanted to see if anybody, Chelsea or mm -hmm. anyone would like to, Kate, share some updates from your side of, of things. <laughs> I can, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think there's a ton. Um, I think I mentioned last time and I shared our legislative agenda um, and, and just how um, much alignment there was with the governor's recommended budget, particularly focusing around ending children's homelessness. Um, and there are several kind of programs and um, pots of money. Um, one of them that I highlighted was the Addressing Child Homelessness, and that's about the increased coordination between DHS and um, OHCS and kind of leveraging the Family Self-Sufficiency Program. So um, we did, and I had to look at the email just to make sure I'm getting all these committees right, um, but we had our budget presentation um, to the Ways and Means Subcommittee on Transportation and Economic Development. Uh, that was last week. There was like three days worth of presentations, um, and I checked in with our um, government, um, our legislative liaison, and um, she said it went really, really well, and we had a full day of public testimony and had some really great um, public testimony about the need for increased funding around this pot um, of money. So we're excited, we're hopeful. Ariel says things are moving along well as they should. So hopefully by the next meeting, I'll have some additional updates for y'all. All right, thank you, Chelsea. Thank you. Uh, Lisa. I think the only update I would add to that, we finished, we collectively, OHA and DHS, finished our first round in front of Ways and Means this morning. Um, I, the one thing I did want to mention is on the House side, there was a TANF work group that was convened to look at some potential investments. So child care has emerged um, as a priority. It was a, a group with um, legislators and stakeholders. What that means, we don't know next, but we'll know as that begins to take some shape. So just wanted to flag that that emerged out of that work group as a priority for potential investments, as did, of course, housing. So working closely with HCS on what that will look like. But isn't tomorrow like the deadline for anything that's actually going to happen in this session? Scheduling. 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 Yeah, it's rescheduled by now. Happen by the as long as they're not in, in certain committees where bills get sent up to like ways and means and rules or yeah. revenue. Mm -hmm. Budget committees. Uh, so, yeah, Ways and Means is a joint committee, and any other joint committee, like joint student success, carbon reduction, they don't have the deadlines and rules. So those are the, the yeah, carbon reduction and rules and joint student success would be the policy committees that don't have to adhere to that deadline. And then um, Ways and Means doesn't have that same deadline. Plus, ultimately, no bill is dead until sunny day. Exactly. <laughs> Zombie bills. They do show up in Pop other up iterations, don't they? Different yes. numbers. <clears throat> so, Liesl, I was really trying to understand. So, what's the next step with that? 
Um, that that work group is working closely with um, Alyssa Kenny Geyer's committee to have those proposals take shape. Um, and then, of course, it's dependent on are there actual resources to fund those investments. So it's kind of part of the sausage making at this point. So we'll keep you updated as that moves forward. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, OHA, any? Yeah. Yeah. So Updates. as Liesl just I actually had to smile during. Chelsea's presentation. I used to work at an agency where you do your budget in three days, and we just finished our three weeks. Oh. <laughs> budget, pres, budget I'm just glad that I didn't have to be. I would make you so nervous. <laughs> um, and the good news is the co-chairs, when they released their budget, uh, uh, among other things, held uh, Oregon Health Plan harmless. And so they mm. basically fully funded Medicaid, w which means no cuts in enrollment uh, or That's benefits. Great. The bad news is all of our policy packages are lying by the side of the road on, on, on the way to that, which includes uh, home visiting and uh, Office of Child Health and a bunch of investments around uh, uh, behavioral health, including for children. The public health modernization. Public health modernization as well. The, uh, the good news, bad news, good news is <laughs> oh, uh, if anybody asks you what you think about the tobacco tax, there are many reasons you should say you think it's a good idea, but one of them is... Uh, that it generates revenue that uh, could then go back into uh, some of the general fund that's uh, that's backfilled, and the numbers that are being talked about are anywhere from about ninety million dollars to a couple hundred million dollars that could go back in from tobacco tax. So, it, so aside from all of the um, copious public health benefits to raising the price of tobacco, you also get some cool stuff probably. And I understand that has impacts on the education budget as well, right? Well, yeah, it would be yeah. it would be part of freeing up freeing up general fund that right now they've dedicated to the health plan. Yeah. Right, the trickle down effect. That would be among the <laughs> things. Yes. Does that okay. include vaping, vapors as well? E-cigarettes oh. are a part of the I thought I remember that. Part of the proposal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which are not taxed. They're not taxed at all. Today. At all, at this yeah. point. Yeah. So they need, okay. they would be taxed. Yes. Okay. Yes. I just want to add a couple to that are in, that are interesting. Um, House Bill 2220 um, would allow dentists to be able to purchase and provide immunizations in a dental setting. So that's kind of interesting in terms of our integration of oral health and physical health, um, which is really exciting. I went to Kaiser and, and I got an immunization. I thought, oh, it's already there. But now they've embedded an RN into the <laughs> dental clinic. So this would free up dentists, which is kind of great. Um, of course, House Bill 3063, which removes um, all exemptions except for medical exemptions around immunizations, is still moving forward, so that's of interest. And then our beloved House or Senate Bill 526, um, which supports the universally offered home visiting, um, was sent to Ways and Means. So it's going to sit there until June, according to Senator Senator Hayward. Um, it basically provides the... Um, the mandate, if you will, for commercial health plans to participate in providing services of universally offered home visiting and the Oregon Health Authority, the authority to design and implement and, and maintain mm -hmm. a program for Oregon. So. Could, could we, I think, uh, to Pat's point, maybe bills aren't ever really I'll die, but I think yeah. that they'll, um, until the end, but that we will have some paring down. Because I think what you're looking at as a tracker is just the ones that we're monitoring that have implications for the early learning division. So maybe by the next council meeting, we could just have something that's sort of like at a glance, maybe capturing all of these or the ones that are still kind of on the table. So we're looking at a more comprehensive list with that. Do you yeah, think we, that would we could, be? If, if, if what you're asking is, could we bring a list of the things we think are still legitimately alive? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. impact raise up Oregon. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking um, yeah. we could work We could work with your legislative coordinators. I think you've been saying them verbally, but that at that point we could have something more streamlined yep. that represented all of the things that were still impacting the plan. Yep. Great idea. Candace, do you have anything <clears throat> to add from ODE? No, our big ones, um, Senate Bill 12, the last one I shared last time, um, the, um, the couple that we're moving and watching, nothing has updated or changed. They've been moved to committee right now, and so we're just waiting to see. And Senate Bill 12? Is, is the safe, inclusive, and effective schools. So that's the big project that we're looking at, um, how we partner in multiple ways with ESDs and our, our local districts on um, not just the hardening of facilities for safe schools and partnering with our federal grants, but also the social emotional components, the trauma informed learning, mental health, bringing that all together in a, a systematic way. 
So there's it's a big pilot project that we're pushing. So, a new unit in my floor. So. Okay. There is one I just wanted to flag that, that just changed substantially this week, and I don't know the number on it. DM Hill County had originally had a bill proposing to take on child welfare services, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that has been scaled back to look more at like a collective impact or prevention focused um, approach uh, to do some work specifically at DM Hill County around kids. So that's just one to flag. Um, and Miriam, I'll, I'll send you the number when I, okay. when I track that. Okay, great. Great. 2348. Uh, Adopted dash one amendments yesterday and moved to ways and means. Um, the well, it says here directs department to reduce subsidy recipient co payments to no more than 10%. Okay. It's been amended to be 7%. Or I love program. Um, yes. Well, it's 3393. Yeah. Thank you. 3393. Okay. Thank you. Um, other agencies for adding. More because, as Miriam said, this list in our packet is just what the early learning division is following. But obviously, what you all are doing is also equally important. Um, <clears throat> all right, anything else to come? Well, raise so this is our implementation document. Um, it's yeah, we're working at session, is a big part of implementation. implementation. <laughs> yes, <laughs> okay. I know there are other things going yeah. on. Hubs are making presentations, yeah. and um, I think what we saw today from OPIP was great because they just spelled out what objectives they're focused on and, and connected to. So I think the more we can encourage that kind of um, alignment as people make presentations, uh, that's how it's going to roll out. I believe Colleen's memorized every objective and strategy. <laughs> <laughs> She's on it. <laughs> yeah. There's probably a small group right. in that category with you on the yeah. list, Alyssa. Yeah. All right. If there's no other business, then we stand adjourned. Thank you all Thank you. very much. Thanks for you on the phone. Right on time. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Goodbye. <laughs>